If left unattended, data would cover the desks of researchers and gather dust. To be useful, it must be organized into a data matrix, a row column table of scores. In square 11, you made a spreadsheet of scores. Each row is a person, and each column is a variable. In square 12, you determined the level of measurement of each variable. In square 13, you plotted your data, checking for skewed distributions. You make graphs to make sure your variables were normally distributed. In square 14, you're going to try to find the center of your distribution. The reason we look for the center of a distribution is because normally distributed variables have a center. That is, most people are in the middle of the curve. Although there is some variability, we know that the majority of people have similar scores. This is an important point. We have a lot in common with other people. This commonality allows us to describe a characteristic as normal. What we want to find is one score that represents the entire distribution. The whole idea of number crunching is to make it easier. No one can process or understand all of the scores, so we look for patterns, and we look for shortcuts. Luckily, there is a pattern. All variables look the same. Regardless of what variable is being measured, the scores follow the same pattern. Most scores are in the middle, and there are less and less on each end. Musical ability follows this pattern. Intelligence follows this pattern. So does tap dancing, golfing, singing, memorizing, talking, and sleeping. There's some variation in scores. Not everyone has the same score. But most scores are clustered in the middle. So the reason we calculate central tendency is that there is a central tendency. Scores tend to be in the center of a distribution. On any given variable, most people are in the middle. Finding the center is the first step to understanding a variable. The next step is finding how far the scores are from the center, but we need to find the center to move on. So it's crucial that we find a good estimate of where the center is. Think of it as an unusual jigsaw puzzle. In most puzzles, you look for the corner pieces. You start with the corners and work your way toward the center. In statistics, there are no corners. You have to start in the center and work your way out toward the unknown edges. We're also lucky that we have three measures of central tendency, mean, median, and mode. In a normal distribution, they all agree. We know that when the three don't agree, we need to look carefully at the data. The mean is the average. Just add up the numbers and divide by n, the number of scores. It's that easy. The mode is even easier. The mode is the most common score. Think of it as popularity. Whichever score occurs most often is the mode. Just count how many times people pick each score. The real value of the mode is detecting irregularities in the shape of a distribution. In our beautiful ideal of normally distributed scores, there's only one peak on the mountain, and from that peak, there's a smooth, symmetrical curve that sweeps down toward the baseline. If there are two or three modes, you know the distribution is not normal. A bimodal distribution, two modes, probably indicates that you left somebody out. If you left them out on purpose, then it's okay. You might have wanted to look at extremely talented and extremely untalented musicians, so you could see if your test of musical ability differentiates between them. Researchers often maximize differences in age, ability, or experience. If there is a problem with a test, it will show up in the extremes. But if you forgot to measure the middle group, then having two modes will remind you of your error. Similarly, the median is a good alert signal. The median is the continental divide. Half the scores, regardless of their magnitude, are below it, and half are above it. In a distribution with an odd number of scores, the median is literally the middle score. If there is an even number of scores, the median is the average of the two middlemost scores. But one big reason to love medians is that they provide a double check on the mean. If the median doesn't agree with the mean, you should investigate the data so you know why this occurred. A median that is higher than the mean might indicate that there are outlying scores at the bottom of the distribution. If this negative skew is large enough, the mean might not be the best representative of the distribution. Obviously, if the median is below the mean, it also could indicate a skewed distribution. In this case, the outlying scores would be high scores, and the distribution would be positively skewed. Overall, the mean is the best representative of a normal distribution. Like the median and mode, it indicates the center of the distribution. In a normal curve, all three agree, you get exactly the same score. But means also reflect the impact of all scores. It is the balance point in a distribution. It is the middle, taking magnitude into consideration. The mean represents the average typical person. It's the hypothetical middle point that balances the entire distribution, which is why we end up with 2.4 children or 3.1 cars. 
Unlike the meet in and mode, the meet is very sensitive to outline scores. We started with two variables, handedness and intelligence. Since handedness is a categorical variable, there is no distribution of scores, and no center to that distribution. IQ, our operational definition of intelligence, is a continuous variable, and we could find its center. We know from the graphs we made in square 13 that it is positively skewed, and the mean is a bit above the median. In the general population, we'd expect the mean of IQ to be a 100. In our imaginary study, the IQ for our sample was 105. Now that we have a center, we'll look at variability next.